Well, you know how we have this uh, in iOS 17, you can record your voice uh, or record it so that it would um, it, like if you're losing your voice or something, you can you can save it for prosperity and then re have it reiterate stuff that you wanted to say. I mean, I think we should just do it and then, you know, create a script, have an AI generated script and then have our voice read that script. This is uh, either brilliant or terrible. We'll have Bing I mean, generate a script horrible. for us. <laughs> but, I just want Bing to do it so we can say Bing generated the script because I think it's funnier than saying chat GPT. Do you need a Microsoft account? A Microsoft? Yeah, you need like a free Microsoft oh, account. It's not the worst. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if you got that, I don't know what they're account. tracking about it. They're tracking all the horrible things you're trying to get. <laughs> you're trying, <laughs> you're trying to get Bing to, to say. say. Yeah. Like, Bing, do you love me? No, seriously. Do you love me? That's, that's what. I don't think I've tried that one yet. What, are you afraid? Are you afraid they'll fall in love with you and start telling you to get rid of people in your life? Welcome to Billy Coco Presents Side Project Spotlight, Episode 52. It's a developer's journey into making cool stuff. I'm Kotaro. I'm Steve. And I'm Aaron. And we are Philly Coco, a Philadelphia-based Cocoa Heads community focused on Apple development. That primarily, but not exclusively, means iOS, Mac, tvOS, watchOS, and visionOS development. Philly Coco's two, de- yeah. Philly Coco's two desire is to take you higher on your own developer journey. Holy crap, I just totally messed it up. I flubbed it at the end. I'm so sorry. That's my bad. We're not doing it again. I mean, we could, we could do it <laughs> no, again. No, but, but we're no, not. No, we're, we're keeping that in. We're keeping that, we're keeping that in. <laughs> 52, does that oh. mean two, we've been doing this for two years? Um, mm, I, I feel like we've been doing it for longer. <laughs> but, I guess slightly longer. Well, we do it every, yeah, we do it every Other two every weeks, two week, pretty yeah. much. Yeah, like almost. We've been pretty. I don't think we've ever missed a, 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 a session. I mean, I could be wrong, but. It's pretty, been pretty consistent. Cause that's how we roll in Philly Coco. I know, right? They got a consistent stay. to a fault. Yes, no. I mean that was one of the things that I I forgot if it was um if it was somebody from Philly Game Mechanics or somebody or or uh, Zorn that had said one of the key things to having a uh, successful meetup group is to always to be consistent. You know, regardless, you know, if anybody shows up or fifty or a hundred people show up. You know, there's always going to be highs and lows, but you have to stay the course. Um, so just anybody who's aspiring or going through times of like trying to say, well, is this meetup worth it? How long, you know, like, is it ever going to be enough people? I, I assure you, it's always ups and downs. And it just is a matter of being consistent and, you know, slowly, incrementally get better or work to get better. Yeah. And the, that's a good segue into Philly Coca updates. Ooh, we have updates. <laughs> Well, we uh, we just had our at the time of recording this, we just had our side project Saturday recently, mm-hmm. our latest one for September. Yep. And now it's October and we have one more in person coming up at the end of the month. And then I think we're just going to play it by ear and maybe do maybe I'll do a Zoom call one of those November or December, but yeah. Uh it's a it's a tough time to schedule and in the past and like literally nobody showed up and it's you know uh it's, it's yeah pr- it's it's we're not going to do an in-person one though for the last two months of the year yeah definitely every, everyone's gonna be busy with thanksgiving and new year's yeah I, I think we would probably most likely take a break for november and december just because it's particularly yeah. when we schedule side project saturdays up at the end of the month as you said so it's not uh it's, otherwise you have to you have to like move it up yeah. in the month and it's it's just november and december are rough so we'll probably take a break so make sure you you come to the next one at the end of october it'll be on the meetup.com and probably on our website and stuff soon. We usually announce it uh, the second week ish mm-hmm. of the month. Usually when I put it up there after our monthly meeting, Yep, yep. which we do have coming up, but, but that last side project uh, was a good one. We were still in the Willow Grove giant community center. Uh, plenty of uh, coffee downstairs. There's a and, Starbucks. Uh, there's a Starbucks and uh, coding upstairs in the community. And, need, uh, and, and what have, what have we been trying to code up? <laughs> well, there was a lot of interesting discussion mm-hmm. last time. Uh, people were doing their own thing, so I wasn't privy to all of it. I think there was some discussion about uh, was there a discussion about a job leak job leak, questions leak, or leak code leak code. <laughs> we're still on that uh, that process. Which who was doing that? There was uh, a, Kevin. 
Um, Kevin and, and, and Zorn, and, I think, were there, and they were doing it. Uh, yeah, they were doing some whiteboard stuff. You and I were talking about my. I was up. I was building a API client like everybody has to do, and mm-hmm. figuring out how to. I was modifying my current one, making it more like I don't know, modern Swift based with like modeling it with uh some some simple protocols and and structs and to be flexible and handle environments and be able to be adaptable as I move forward. Yep. Uh, to to separate some concerns out. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was also based on some of the talk, uh, um, Napier's talk, right? Right. It was uh, the talk on, I think we mentioned it before, it was the one on uh, generic Swift doesn't have to be hard. It's a few years old now. Mm-hmm. And one of those, I think it's like a couple versions, but they're on YouTube. But uh, he had some good insights in that one. And I, uh, about, and he models like an API client and loosely, I took some ideas from that. So what, you mean good. generics in Swift or generics? Swift? Yeah, gener- it was about generic. It was about generics in okay. Swift, but he used, most of the talk is him kind of building up a API client mm. by, by starting with concrete code and then separating concerns out. And I had concrete code, so I was separating concerns out. And one of his ideas I took was uh, he separated like the transport level thing, like the thing that actually makes a URL request call mm-hmm. and from other aspects of it. And uh, I did that too, because that was one of the things I needed. I needed, um, I'm trying to make it easier to use like Swift previews for one thing or testing. We might be talking about that later. Mm-hmm. The uh, the the problem is, you know, when you have an actual API client, you have to set it all up for real. Mm-hmm. It makes it kind of hard to do previews or control, you know, the data you get back. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, and uh, I separated out. I had everything in the original version was all kind of in like one giant method. You know, it was like the first pass. Mm-hmm. So I separated that out to a simple protocol. It had like one function, like a fetch function that took, I think, a URL request, return data. That's what he did. And so then um, the client uh, will pass the uh we'll figure out the 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 URL request from this other structure you pass into it mm-hmm. um like the endpoint structure and then it will um get back the data and the client will then handle turning it into a model uh, so so it's all it, so dumb yeah. dumb question um is that fetch just a this a more glorified get request or is it a common can you do a post and a get is that is that flexible in that sense or do you uh, set, create a different yeah. method for that a separate method for that, like a post or a fetch, or uh, yeah. So uh, I have a basically a I, I dis, I'm modeling the resources of like a RESTful mm. APIs. Okay, so like the endpoint would be like you know I don't know uh, backyard squirrels, we'll say because uh, I want to copy that, <laughs> and I want to I want to get I want to get the, the backyard squirrels API. So like maybe one of the one of the uh, one of the endpoints is uh, nuts. Okay. So I would I have to create like a, create a structure. I create a uh, uh, an actually an enum. Okay. That uh, and I I had a, a simple protocol and one of the, and the protocol included things like what the HTTP verb should be mm-hmm. as like a like a string or whatever yeah, or in this sense. case I think I modeled it a lot but and it has like a parameters like an array of parameters is one of the things mm-hmm. and. It has, a, it also has a, you know, like all this typical stuff has the path, mm-hmm. um, the base URL and stuff that like you made. And then you can make extension on that. So then I made an extension on that base resource protocol to provide like a default implementation that says, okay, default, we're going to assume it's a get request and there's no parameters and, you know, like a, maybe a couple other things. And then that just simplifies it, you know, later. And then when you want to make like a call to the, to the nuts endpoint of the get squirrels API. You're gonna create one, and you're gonna say like the the base URL is whatever, and then like the path is nuts, and then maybe I have to do a query parameter of like number of nuts, and so then that would be the parameters thing. So you do it as an enum because that way each one of those, and this is like a common thing. It's not like my unique idea here. Yeah. This is like you see this all over the internet. Yeah. You take you take like the property um, that you're you're that was from the protocol like var parameters which was like a, like an optional list of like array of string to string right yeah and then you you make that that property then underneath of it you say switch on self because the whole structure is an enum mm-hmm. and then it forces you to go through each each thing and each one of those cases is actually the like the actual kind of um call you'd make so if you can get nuts one of the cases would be get nuts if you could post nuts or you could like you know whatever you want to call it you'd have post nuts 
So like each each uh each like yeah each action you can take on the resource is modeled as a case in the enum, and then each I, part of the protocol that you that, which represents the information you need in order to create a URL request, you overload those properties and you switch on the enum in order to make sure you've exhausted everything. Now it is a little bit of you know like you have to like you know write this stuff out, and that's why you write some extensions to to simplify the the basic ca- cases. And some people don't like this, and I've seen other pe- other approaches that work fine. Yeah. But I I like this approach so far, even though you do kind of have to remember to override the stuff. I like it because it does the one thing it does is it forces you to and this this comes from kind of the philosophy that i've been I've been picking up from like the composable architecture, but it forces you to to model everything like if you say here's what I can put in one place and like and I can put in one place in my structure or an extension or structure I can say here's all my cases these represent all the things I can do in this resource, and then Wherever I need to implement my uh, my structure to determine what a URL request is, I'm forced to model every case, even if that means like I just return nothing. Like I can't forget something. That's the important part about it, and it makes it easy to look at the code and say like what are all the things that I can do by doing as as an emum. In the previous designs of stuff I did in like Objective C, for instance, you know you'd have um, methods you can look at. You know you'd have like function names and stuff, and in this case, instead of function names, you basically have enum cases that are that you're you're looking at if you want to figure out like what are the like what are the things i can do in this api uh and it, it's i think i like it because it makes it very straightforward to just look in one one place in your file and then the other reason i want to do this was i'm structuring this app in swift with a swift package uh module well it's like with it's like one swift package and a bunch of modules library modules that are inside of it because of reasons switch ui is annoying with multiple actual spms sure. but uh and so that means i can have a library that's an entire feature okay the feature has a dependency on the api client it may have a dependency on some shared theme or ui elements or something mm-hmm. that you you can you can put in the in the swift package declaration you can say these are the, the libraries it depends on the package just has to implement that structure for the api client it just has to implement like here's my structure and i also what i've been doing is i've been doing it in a particular pattern so i've been using enums to create namespaces to make it consistent so every even though it's multiple modules i make sure when i actually implement my protocol my create my little structure for to to tell you what a resource is and the you know the the hp method and stuff i put it under i do extensions on like i think i start with api and then i underneath that i i put in my I put in enums to basically create quote unquote namespaces so that everything's organized. So then basically at the call site, this is what it looks like. You have your API client and then you say uh, API client dot fetch. And then the first parameter is the type. So it might be nuts dot self, like nut dot self, because you're getting a nut or an array of nuts. It would be an array of nut dot self. <laughs> okay. And then the second parameter would be the resource structure, okay. the resource enum, right? Structure. And then that would be like, it would be like API dot, I don't know, uh, backyard squirrels dot nuts dot get nuts. And like, that would be how you could call it. So then it's, it's easy when you're writing at the call site to also get a list of all the things you can do again with enums. One of the things from the, from the TCA stuff is when you have enums doing this stuff, it's, it's very easy to just, um, or if you're just modeling things as, as, as like value structures in general, you can say dot and like get a list of all the cases, like all the things that this can do. Mm-hmm. So I don't have to think about it. I can just be like, okay, I want to do, I want to, I can, I, I just drill down the way I want to. Uh, and then you can also do things which I've done, like do a type alias to some lower level of that hierarchy. So if you don't want to write like API dot, 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 right, you right, can just do right, a quick right, type right, alias right. to make it easier. Yeah. But everything is conceptually organized so that wherever whatever module you're in even though they're different libraries that could be in different spms mm-hmm. like whatever you are you can you can still use the same api pattern mm-hmm. to, to get you can still find anything mm-hmm. because i i've learned from experience that when you're working with big lots of apis you have like a lot of api endpoints to deal with yeah sometimes multiple actual api servers with very different kinds of uh, resources and stuff you need mm-hmm. to have some way to keep that all straight or you end up wasting a lot of time just trying to figure out where to go in your code base to update stuff 
or like where, like, like how to call something appropriately. Mm -hmm. Like after you haven't looked at it for a long time, right? you know, you're like, oh, you know, okay, okay, what what is this thing? And then you, this way, everything is kind of localized. So I go into the one feature package or library. I go into the, the folder called API client. I look there for the, the actual models for the, the, the implements that protocol. And there you go. And then as for the transport part of things, that I um I made URL session a transport. I just said that URL session and and transport just has a method. The protocol is just one method. It's like mm-hmm. fetch, as I said, it takes a URL request. So and basic and that's from that Napier talk. So then the URL session, which it's so far this is working because at the time he did that talk, this didn't work. He had to wrap URL session, mm-hmm. but it works. So that means my transport by default can just be a URL session and it works. And I can do I can change my protocol if I want a little bit. I need to, but it, 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 it works. And then I can create, I create another uh, transport, which was just adding my authentication to it. So the way, what that did was it took a dependency on my auth- authorization client, which, which is like an OAuth client I wrote. Mm-hmm. And that's a final class observable thing. And that, that's one of the parameters you put into the initializer for that. And then the other thing you put in that initializer is like your base transport, which would be like URL session. Okay. So then I can build, basically you can just kind of wrap and this is maybe not the nicest, you know, um, way of call site wise, but you can like say, here's like authorization transport. The base is a URL session, you know, transport. And then you, and inside the, um, the, the authorization transport, it's very little code. All it does is it, it like uses the auth client to like refresh a token if it has to, and to get the bearer token and adds it as a header and spits back out a URL request to the base, um, the base, uh, transport then the base transport gets that url request which now has the bearer token in it and then actually does the request because that's what the the base one does and then so that way you can kind of build up the functionality uh without putting it on one giant method and then you can do things like at a pre on in a preview you can say you can just make a fake transport i'm still i might have to modify this to make it a little bit more easier to do but you can just make a transport and just overload that one function and return whatever you want. It doesn't really matter. Like it depends on what you're doing in your preview. But if you don't need it to work, you don't actually need to get anything from that um, URL request. You can just, uh, you know, just have it return like anything, anything that is a data. Uh, you can make it make it return whatever you want. So I have to figure out how I want to um, make that a little little easier to uh, build out for previews. But it, it does mean that I, I've been able to very quickly just like uh, get my previews working. Yeah. Because that was one of the things that was broken, because he like had to give it a full on API client before for anything to work. And I was like, I don't, and I don't really want it making requests or anything when I'm just trying to work on the UI. Yeah. You know, yeah. again, another thing I've gotten from TCA and from just general good programming is that you you know you want to keep things, uh, you want to be able to keep things separated. Uh, and and uh, Swift UI previews are really great, but I find that it's very easy to very quickly shoot yourself in the foot because you're creating dependencies. And not controlling them properly in your in your uh, views. But are you if if you're just doing it as an API client, right? Or, or yeah, consuming of some kind of API. Mm-hmm. In wouldn't you wouldn't you make a mock data set um, for scenarios like preview? Or are you actually doing a hit on the? Are you actually hitting an API when you do the previews? Well. Um... No, I'm not actually trying to hit an API. It's basically I'm trying to mock it. I'm just saying okay. the like the the Swift UI view I'm looking at mm-hmm. takes in like the 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 um you know the backyard squirrels model. And the backyard squirrels model calls the API client internally and needs the API client as an as a dependency. So right now it's designed to take that in as at the constructor. Okay. So what do you pass in when you're actually trying to create your preview? Because remember previews are like starting from zero, you have mm-hmm. to completely set up the environment. Right. So if I want to test this model or test this view that takes this model in, mm-hmm. like how do I how do I mock it up? And like I need points at which you can inject stuff. And this is not the end of my my attempts. I just, you know, but, but at least this means I can get the thing running now. Yeah. You know, and I could I could have it return whatever I wanted for the for the preview. It might be a little and and other times I've done things that are like a little higher level. It kind of depends on what you're what you're testing, but if I just wanted to set up the 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 model that this view depends on and just get it to work, you know, like this gave me a way of doing that without actually having a, a real API call attempt to go out. Just out of curiosity, when we talk about the the transport um, bit, uh, 
in terms of like you can do a URL session, would you set up like a, a G um a GRPC or a a or like a WebSocket layer in that same one, or would you move that to its own thing? I mean, you you probably make you make your own transport. The whole point is it's kind of pluggable. Mm-hmm. As long as the 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 contract is that the transport gets a URL request mm-hmm. and returns data. What it does inside, how it actually it it's, it doesn't matter. Like what I'm doing by default is uh, I need to make HTTP calls, mm-hmm. and URL session does that. URL session gets gets a URL you 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 get do a URL request and then return data. That's what URL session is. Right. Like that's what we usually use it for. So you could have anything as long as you can take in URL request and use that to start with. Then the and of course you could change the protocol too. It does, this is just the one I have, but. But the the transport layer it allows you to put in the code the just that code you need because you're, if you're outputting just data, and, and this this also applied when I was doing Objective C stuff, data is like a foundational type and it's it's pretty easy to you can pass that around between layers and stuff like that and you can encode it or decode it into things you know so, and you can use that just you can decode that directly into um you know if it's if it's JSON you can uh, decode it in uh, you know the JSON decoder into a model, which is what I do right now at the, at the client. So the, in the client, um, the client has a fetch method that fetch method takes in, you know, some other information like the resource I said, or you could do it, you could do it even differently. You could create your own kind of request type, whatever, but it comes in and it takes that information and it says, get, and then I, 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 I say, give me the URL request. So I make the, the reason, one of the things on my, my resource protocol that again, models an endpoint of an AP of a, re, a rest API. So like the like the the you know the backyard squirrel slash nuts protocol. that that yeah, <laughs> yeah the protocol would would say as part of that I have a function that you should override that returns a URL request it builds it up based upon the information in the structure mm-hmm. like the base URL and the path and the parameters you whatever you have and then that way I offload that to that to that structure so that means whenever I I yeah that means everything is kind of centralized. It's working pretty well so far, and it, I think it's fairly flexible. So I can say I have this, you know, this API, and I have this endpoint, and I can model it out, and I can say if this is everything it needs. Mm-hmm. And then in the client, the client's only a few lines of code right now. The client just gets the URL request from the resource structure, passes it to transport. Transport gives it back the data, and then it takes the data and turns it into the model mm-hmm. because the the client knows two pieces of information. It knows the model type. Right, mm-hmm. the like, which is like the codable, sure, and it knows the resource um, structure, which gives it all the information to, uh, it, which allows you to get like a URL request, right? And um, and then the transport just is just offloads that, does whatever. So that way you could you can swap that out, do other things. Mm-hmm. So it's for instance, one obvious thing to do is I have my default. You can easily have a default transport, which is URL session dot shared if you want. It doesn't matter, or or a custom one, but that has no authentication parameters on it. So that's perfectly fine if you're just making calls to an endpoint doesn't require any authentication. But then if you want a version that does, then you just give it a transport that that has that authentication uh, transport added to it. Mm-hmm. So and then you give that one to a different client uh, and that one works. And so it, like they 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 can share a lot of the under underlying code, but then you can just kind of modify them in small ways to kind of fit the different circumstances you need. So I'm probably going to need to make one to add different headers. Mm -hmm. And then at this point, I'm probably going to try to make maybe like a static factory method or something to put it all together more conveniently. So I don't have to like wrap them like three layers deep with the nits or do other, some other way of the call, make the call site, but that's just like call site, making the call site easier. Conceptually, it's, it's just um, making small bits of functionality that I can, Mm -hmm. I can combine together and, and uh, maybe it's not the best way of like at the call site doing it, but it works. And so I'm probably going to need to make one to add headers for things, uh, you know, like for, like if I need to set the, 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 the document type or whatever I'm yeah, looking for, if I need right. to set like, uh, uh, you know, other headers, like headers for the, for are you, logging or something. Are you using UI component for that? Um, that'll allow you to sort of specif- specify those types of like those types of um, parameters. Like URL component, yeah. So like you can define like domain name, domain, um, yeah. Domain I mean, yeah. I mean, path, it's, it's just, path, yeah. um, uh, uh, header parameters, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah, everything, any anything you would do with a URL request mm-hmm. inside transport, you just use those APIs. Yep. Like, uh, 
Euro component's a great one because I what I'm not I'm not like building strings yeah. by hand. Okay. I'm using the Euro component stuff. Nice. And that means that also in 17 I found out um they changed the RFC that they apply to some some of these for for URL encoding. So prior to 17 I think if you used if you did URL and you gave it a string, you did the, mm-hmm. the initializer, it's URL string and here's like a URL as a string and it does it. Right. It did not um it didn't handle the case where uh, you had a space in like a your in like a query parameter. Oh, okay. Like it would still be in there, and then the URL would fail to 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 work. Right. And so I had this problem recently where the old client, the old, an older client, the mostly Objective C one that I work on, uh, this bug where it the Swift UI part I was using, like it was it was creating the the URL, and then it just like wouldn't work. Mm-hmm. Just would like the like I was I was only showing this UI element if I had a URL, but the URL would, would always be nil because there was a space uh, that was in there. I didn't realize it was in there. Mm-hmm. Now, what's funny is in, in 17, if you compiled it against 17 SDK and ran it on iOS 17, it was fine. It worked because it turns out that they actually automatically URL encode in there. And this is something that you have to pay attention to with some of these APIs because I had the problem where I was URL encoding something and then I used some Apple API and then it was encoding something and then that was double encoding. Oh, that's funny. So you, have to, <laughs> yeah, you have to be kind of keep it straight, but the, the, the new one seems to be much better. It's, it seem it's, to be a, little, it's a little smarter figuring out, okay, this needs to be URL. It seems encoded. smart, yeah. Okay. Like, I, mm-hmm. like now if I give it a URL encoded string, like properly yeah. encoded with like percent %20 for space, mm-hmm. it works in 16, works in the, new, the update API in 17, and this is because they they had a they had a there was a difference in the way like I think URL did things and the way URL components did things. Mm-hmm. I think it was URL components. One of the other URL objects, like they both like there was there was times where they did encoding different. Like like I ran into this when I was oh, trying to do um when I was trying to set up query parameters for like an OAuth mm-hmm. call. Yeah. Like it was it was like I think it was it was a uh, just encoding things weirdly. Like it was in and in, in the um the server guy when I was like what is going on with this I was like what does the log look like. He's like, oh, you're double encoding this parameter. I'm like, I'm double encoding it. Like, what do you mean? I was like, because the Apple was encoding it, and I was encoding it. So, you know, you gotta I've, pay attention I've, to that stuff. I've been there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh but, my goodness, but, those are horrible. Uh, those are horrible moments. But I guess if you understand what I'm saying with the API client, yeah. The yeah. main, the main thing is it's um, I got, I'm getting a lot of inspiration lately from the composable architecture guys at point free yeah. now explain the, the, the acronym for people who don't know when sometimes you were saying T, uh, TCA. tca that's basically the composable architecture i assume yes <laughs> it's called the composable architecture i i, I as Why opposed to just like composable <laughs> i i mean I, it could be called cub and then people might think you're talking about california I mean, although, or, or would it be redundant to call it the, the tca architecture right Oh, that's like calling like an ATM machine. Oh, yeah, yeah, or uh, chai tea, <laughs> chai tea. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but uh, so those guys, I've been, I've been, uh, so uh, I bought a subscription to their for a year for their um, website at Point Free. Was it dot co? Uh, I O, I think. That I O, yeah. And they have a long video series. I've been get, working it through, and they have some really good stuff. And oh, CO. they talk about the code architecture. Co. 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 They have a they they have a particular philosophy about how you should build um, software, and they uh, applied this to Swift UI as well. Mm-hmm. And I think TCA is actually a good architecture. It it, it does kind of fit um, Swift UI, but I'm not going to go into a whole detail about it because I'm not sure I could necessarily go into whole detail. But the whole the kind of point is you have it's kind of based based on Redux, I guess. If you if you know anything about Redux stuff on the JavaScript land. And um, every so everything you do is you you're trying to model everything in value types. That's like number one. Create a thing called a reducer, which is just like functions. And then you create like you model out your state in this struct, right? So all the state you want, and then you you say all the actions I'm going to do are an enum, and every case in there is one of the actions I'm going to do. And then the result of doing anything in your app is to call some is to call one of the, this reducer and these one of these actions and to return some effect so everything goes to the same this one place in the code and it flows through and so you call an action the action creates an effect and then and you, you can so, break it down into smaller and smaller reducers if you can um please for the people who don't know what a reducer is please refresh our memory or please please remind us what that is <laughs> What they're what they're doing is like they call it they're a reducer 
is the combination of like your state and the all the actions you can take on it. Res- res- return the result of a combining of the elements of of the sequence using a given closure is what it reduces. But you're saying that their version reducer is different. Um, I mean, everything they do is taken out is taken from uh, uh, it's taken from uh, you know functional programming. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. I'm not an expert in functional programming, so they just have a standard um, way you construct every screen essentially. Mm-hmm. So every you, every model you make, you build it the same exact way. They have a protocol. I think it's I think it's called reducer. Yes, yes. Um, and you implement that protocol and. Uh, that protocol includes creating state uh, actions and what well, there's like side effects or something. Mm-hmm. So you just, you, you, and you, you don't have, and uh, oh, yeah, so you, so you get, you, you, there's a given state of your model mm-hmm. and there's an action you're doing. And then you, it's then the result is going to be a new set of state. Okay. And then, you know, so it's, it fits well with the Swift UI where the, the UI is supposed to reflect the, some kind of state object. You know, like, and, and, and they're, but what I get from them is I haven't actually used the entire, like the TCA library to build anything Mm -hmm. yet. Okay. Myself, I've used a few pieces. I've used specifically the um, dependency framework they have, which allows you to model dependencies. Cause this is one of the big things they they talk about is take control of your dependencies. Allows you to model dependencies in a similar way. You might do the environment objects Mm -hmm. in Swift UI. See, one of the things about Swift UI, is that the environment's cool, but it only works in SwiftUI views. Mm-hmm. Like if you have an observable model, for instance, you can't be like, give me this other thing from the environment because the environment doesn't exist in strictly just in a model. Like it has sure. to be within the context of a Swift UI, uh, you know, structure. So uh, if you ever try it, it won't work. So anyway, but they have a way of doing the, you set up a dependency and you, you model it as, and their recommendation is you model dependencies as, like value types, like a struct, and they have a specific protocol that they implement where you're required to give it a live implementation, and then optionally you can give it a preview implementation and I think a test implementation. Mm-hmm. And what that means is you it's a function that returns the thing that you are create, saying is a dependency, and this allows you to do two things. If you have a dependency you control, you can often just say this, this thing imp- implements this, this protocol and it works. Or you can do is you can basically wrap external dependencies. That's the main reason for this. Mm-hmm. And you can wrap them in like a struct that then then um, provides you the the type of that dependency that you need for those circumstances, like a like a switch by preview or live or testing. So that way, in each of those scenarios, you're getting what you need, and you can override the things you need to override. They they have a whole library for testing, which is really cool. But but the big thing is like the preview and live thing. I mean, you don't have to use their their tools to do any of this mm-hmm. stuff but and they have in their video series they show they have a long one on swift ui and doing things in swift ui without the tca mm-hmm. but they apply the same concepts so and then what you can and their their whole video series about how they evolved into the the tca to begin with but um their the, the dependency thing i used it most recently for something what the heck was it there was some dependency it was really a pain in the butt to deal with and what it let you do is just say in in your calling site, like in your struct that depended on it, you'd say like a property wrapper with dependency, mm-hmm. and you say what it was, like just like you ha- you have environment and you have like a you know backslash dot some key name, yeah. same thing. You can do it that way. So you can say like dependency, and then you made a custom key, be like you know uh, I don't know um, bag of nuts, <laughs> and <laughs> and you get that's how you get your bag of nuts. Okay. You get your bag of nuts that way, and sure. then and then it's available, and then you don't, and so you don't have to uh, like pass it in all the way down some long hierarchy through inits through like you know sure. initializers. And but ma- mainly it does. It means that when you're in the preview area, you can just say, okay, give me give me my bag of nuts, and it gives you automatically the preview version because mm-hmm. in that context, it gives you the preview version. And when you're running like in the simulator or something, it'll give you the live version. If you're running a test, you have like a test version, uh, and it makes it easier. And it, what the thing about the the composable architecture is really just a bunch of patterns that they implement, like structures, like ways of doing things. So you don't have to think about it. The, you know, we, I think we're used to every time we get to a screen, we have to think about how we want to model this this stuff. Yeah. And they're like, well, here's a prescribed way to start. Like, just do this. Here's your state. What do you need in your state? If you have a dependency, use this thing to model your dependency. 
what are your what are the things that your that your UI can do that is in your your action enum, and you just you just kind of you know do the same process over and over again for everything, mm-hmm. and then that way everything can be composed together, hence composable. Right. At least if I understand it correctly, right? And some of the things I got from that, the dependency library is really good. They have a really nice Swift UI navigation library, mm-hmm. which definitely seems better for alerts, if I remember correctly, than the built-in alert stuff. So one of the things they talk about is alerts and um, sheets and stuff like that, that you want to model them with like an optional, if you can, like a single piece of state. Mm-hmm. Whereas a lot of the APIs, they're by default, ask you for Boolean. And then there's some other piece of, of state you need to provide to actually is like the data you want to show in the sheet or something. But really that's a problem because if you think about it, you can have these weird conditions where the Boolean's true or false, but then so is your, your state is in some weird situation. You, you don't want that. The whole point of their architecture is to avoid these kinds of scenarios. So ideally it's, it's cleaner and simpler. Just be like, well, here's an optional piece of state. If it exists, you know, then give me my sheet and display it. And if it doesn't, don't. And um, they even have this really cool thing called case paths which are modeled after um, uh, the, uh, whatever the, stru- what are the, the paths called for, for structs? You can get the... Uh, Navigation pa- path uh, or... No, no. The, key paths? The key paths, that's right, key paths. So it's a novel after, na- they're, they're modeled after key paths. Mm-hmm. And I think eventually they're, this is, if this is going to be in Swift, something like this, because it's really useful. So you can have a, a navigation element. I think like alert might work this way. We could be like, I have an optional like enum so if it exists or doesn't exist to activate this thing, mm-hmm. but then the particular thing in the enum I care about, I can I can tell you what that is by giving you this path, mm-hmm. this uh, you know case path to it, just like you could a key path in a struct. But the path, but you're able to use enums, which I you know I mentioned earlier why I like enums and and so uh, it's really neat that you could do that, and then it it just it basically like wrappers around uh, Apple's APIs to 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 be able to trigger this stuff differently. Uh, so I use that a little bit, and I'll probably use that a lot more. And I've used, I started using their concept of modeling navigation with, uh, often with enums. Okay. Again, as a main thing. So like uh, an, an obvious, an easy example is a, ta- a tab view is a top level view, like tabs. Mm-hmm. So if you use a default tab, um, like out of the box tab, uh, you know, structure, it's it's it, there's no there. It, it only works when you click on the screen, right? But there's a version that you you take a piece of state, to, I think, to bind to, so you can kind of control it programmatically, which one you're on. So when you do this, you set it up this way. That means at the top level in the app struct, on switch my app starts with the app struct, right? At that level, you can say, uh, here's my, I want to ina- initiate this, the, my, my first view, my content view. My content view takes this model, right? And this model is, an, is modeled in enum, and like I can basically say exactly what tab I want to to start with. So I can, because the tabs are modeled on an enum. So each tab is a case in the enum. Uh, and that the, the model that that view uses, you know, is that enum. So, uh, and then you, you set it up so that, you know, the, the, that powers the actual tab displayed so you can deep link. And if you keep doing this kind of thing throughout your app, or if you use TCA, you kind of get it mostly out of the box, I guess, if you do it the right way. If you do this throughout your app, that means you could theoretically like deep link into your app by just setting up the data to structure at the top of your app mm-hmm. or just passing in the data structure every one. And so during development, what's nice is you can say, I always want this app to run, especially when you have to test things on simulator because not everything works in preview. I can run it in the simulator and it'll just always run to the exactly the screen I want. They have examples in their Swift UI demo um, set of videos that they did where they go easy they easily just change a few things um so a, pr- a few uh, things at the app level at the abstract level and every time they open it, it just goes all the way down to literally a a um a, a um an overlay a sheet mm-hmm. with like a thing with a particular i think with a particular field highlighted like they went like you get you can go all the way to that level if you want to all the way and so then you get this so during development you get this easier um loop when you have to use uh, simulators and and or, or even like previews, you can just kind of open the things. So you don't have to like click around to go into things. And it, it really helps with the, if you do want to actually implement deep linking from a URL or something, that means that you just have to parse the URL and then create the, the structure and then pass that structure in to when you, when you at the, at the entry point of the app and you're, you're there. 
So there's a lot of really good ideas and uh, in the Composo architecture, and I highly recommend that you people check it out. I'll put the link in the show notes because I am not, I do not fully grasp it because I haven't used it totally, and I, I'm still a student of the Composo architecture, and I do hope to use it on a side project. I'm not ready, ready to use it for for real and like work. Mm-hmm. I think I, I think you, I really have to understand it and do it in some other much smaller project than my primary day job before I would I would jump ship. Mm-hmm. But there are plenty of of big shops that do it. I'm pretty sure the Arc browser, if I remember correctly, is a TCA app, and that is huge. I imagine because the web browser. Mm-hmm. So uh, it totally it can be done. Um, if you if you start going down the rabbit hole on YouTube, you find all kinds of cool information, uh, especially about like. Like the edges, the edge cases, if you have a really big app, like performance considerations and stuff. But uh, what's really exciting is that they are they are working on using the the new features from Swift uh, 5.9. The um, what am I thinking of? The, uh, the macros. I'm blanking here. The macros. macros yes, yes. I, I, see, I need more coffee. <laughs> so yeah, they're they're using the macros to simplify. So one of the things you might notice if you go in the Composer architecture, like you might not like some of the ceremony you have to go. But uh, they're they're working on making that vastly improved. And if you watch some of their latest videos where they're talking about the the Composable Architecture extra, uh, Architecture 1.0 launch, they mention a few places where they're going to greatly simplify that ceremony by using uh, by using those new features. So that's not that's it's currently not at 1.0, right? No, it is 1.0 just came out it just like came not out. too long oh, ago. Okay. And and they, they to them that means 1.0 has everything you might need okay. to build like a full app I think. I see. But yeah. it's it's not it doesn't it it it's uh it's at 1.2 next, now. Right, is it? Well, the next versions of it are going to have even more have even more like the macro support. They're going to start a series on macro stuff I think next week. Okay. Is well from when we're recording this, mm-hmm. so it might be out by the time you list by you list this or this week. Okay. Right, if you're listening to this one is live. They might might be starting that, but that's uh, I think it's a paid video. Yes, but I think it's worth subscribing to them. I, I mean, they there there's there's even in their old back catalog, there's just so much stuff that they go through, just co- good good concepts, theoretical and practical, and they show how they apply these ideas in in actual projects uh, from like UI Kit in the older days to mm-hmm. Swift UI. So even if you don't like use their stuff, their ideas necessarily, you agree with them totally because they're opinionated. It's uh. It's just really worth their they're among I feel like the um, the most satisfying like you know iOS tech videos I've I've watched mm. because they're in depth and technical but like they always have a point like they they make that make a point of making sure that every one of their videos has a point like at the end they can say why you'd care about this uh and I think it's cool and functional programming is awesome so the more I think we understand functional programming on the uh iOS side the better we'll be sure because there's a lot of there's a lot of concepts in there that that can that can really help your I think your everyday development if you grasp it. And, and Swift UI does have some decent amount of functional programming support. Yes. So. Yes. Yeah, there are a lot of times where I'll go, oh man, I can't believe I can do this now. All in this like nested array of collect or some kind of collection or something of that nature. I just yeah. do it in one line, slice and dice it in one line, and be like, oh, that, that saved me. Like, yeah, at least <laughs> at least uh, at least you know, I'd say maybe. Uh, six to ten lines of code. You know, yeah, and, exactly. And over time, that's a lot. So, yeah. well, I mean, and when when you when you think about everything as things being a function, then that gives you a lot of power. With sure. just a function, functions are easy to make. Functions are first class citizens in Swift. It's something that that I've been using conceptually more and more as this last year, as I really got into to do much more Swift Swift UI stuff uh, and less Objective C. Like I'm most mostly, I'm. I only do Objective C now to maintain really old stuff, mm-hmm. but uh, even back then I used a lot of closures and things. But it's it was much more awkward and, and difficult to use to like use functions there because you had the just the, the it was just awkward. You know what I mean? Sure. If you remember the Objective C days to like figure out method signatures and stuff. If, but it's, if uh, it's I just, remember it's easier now. If I remember yeah. the Objective C days, oh my goodness, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, they're fading from my from me from my memory oh, too. My and I, when I go back to a uh, I go back to Objective C now. I forget to put the semicolon. Oh, That's how I know dude. it's switched. I forget to prefix everything with at signs. Um, yep. I, I completely forget how to initialize a str- an NS string. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, yeah, <laughs> it's hard to go back and forth. Uh, I do it. I do it. But I, I am noticing that I am now like definitely 
swift Aaron, first Aaron, Aaron, in my mental model. Aaron, you were you were there for the Objective C days, right, Aaron? No, I skipped that. Oh, how, how dare well, you? Lucky you. How dare you? <laughs> I'm, you know what? I'm going to make you do some Objective C code at work. <laughs> uh, I've I, I have done some stuff at work with it, but um, I wasn't using it from the beginning. Right? Yeah, it's yeah, it's not bad or anything. I mean, it is yeah, great for not, the time, especially. But yeah, it's not. It's it's one of those things because we had auto like autocomplete worked really well in Xcode mm. um, for Objective C. Um, it it was it was a joy. Once you get into a rhythm, it's a really a joy to work with. But yeah. that was me. That was that was my feeling, and it yeah. was like the naming naming things was really long, ridiculous, ridiculously long names for functions. But it was useful because I would go back to look at old code. And I'd understand it. Get it was written more get, like prose. Like a function would a method would be like get string from your from you know API from yeah. you know the, the from this you know this thing colon that thing <laughs> it's just... well that's 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 where the swift function signatures we can have like the public name of the uh of the parameter and the private yeah. internal name of the parameter comes from so i write functions all the time i have like like you know like fetch i think my fetch method is like fetch and it's like an unnamed uh parameter model mm-hmm. the first one the yeah. model type and then i think the second one is publicly uh for i think it's for or from it's one of those and then internally it's like you know resource so that way it it reads. I try to write. I've always tried to write my code kind of like like it's prose, mm-hmm. which uh, not everybody does that. But it's 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 a thing that I I picked up I think from Objective C and Apple yeah. World, and yeah. I apply all I, over the place. I swear, I, uh, some of that some of that behavior still tra- trans um, transfers over when I do work. Um, when I do write either functions or even variables, sometimes I'm a little too verbose. But I'm like oh, these these young kids. They just put an I as a var. What is wrong with you people? <laughs> Spell it out. Spell it out. <laughs> I am now future Steve from long time ago when past Steve wrote a bunch of like code. What the like, heck does var X mean? Exactly. It so mean I am. What it says it means. <laughs> exactly. I, I'm. I'm very happy that past Steve often wrote wrote really long verbose names for for variables and functions and stuff because yeah. that way when I read it ten years later. I'm like, oh, that's what, I have no memory of writing it, sure. but I can be like, oh, okay, I understand what this does after reading it a little bit. And the same thing, breaking down things in the function, standard kinds of stuff that you, that you learn, or maybe you, you learn from Uncle Bob if you sure. read any Uncle Bob stuff. I know some people don't like Uncle Bob, but um, he had some good ideas. I think, I think uh, if anything, he he had um, very interesting. Still alive, <laughs> like, like, uh, yeah. like past tense. He's still he's still active, writing yeah, books yeah. and stuff. I mean, I, I I enjoy I enjoy his videos. Actually. They, they, they I are do. I think he's, he's in terms of like how he's enthusiastic about the approach that he um, that he, he that he likes, and particularly around unit testing. Exactly, and just yeah. and unit testing. Yeah, you, I wouldn't even talk about unit testing with the composable architect. That's actually one of the biggest things. And if you watch their videos on unit testing, it's going to blow your mind. Yes, it really so. will, because like if you use their architecture, like their testing framework is so nice. And I wonder how it's going to how how the new Swift testing stuff that I I, I saw a preview of is going to like work out with that in the future. Because it looks like they're making the, there's like a, there's like a, I don't know if you saw it, it's like a Swift testing um, SPM, I think he's going to Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's, it's already making great improvements over like the standard XC test way of doing things. Is it things. a replacement or is it a, I, or I'm is not it really a, sure. is it meant to be like a, or yeah, I mean, is I it like a complementary thing or is it a replacement? I guess, I guess we'll find out. I mean, I, I think the idea is it's supposed to be a more swift a new approach to testing in swift mm-hmm. so who knows if it's i don't even know if it's uh it's in the evolution list i don't yeah. know what status is exactly i do know they have that I, I i saw like a video about it mm-hmm. um that i think it was an ns screencast video another another uh, shout out there yeah. to an old, oh, that's, old school that's, video series that's that old i still school. subscribe to <laughs> so I still, old, I still subscribe it's, old, it's so old they have the the ns yeah, prefix yeah <laughs> it's almost like if it was like philly coco as a coco heads was still a thing it technically is but yeah so um i talked like the whole time and now we're like running out of time so before we go though uh did you want to talk about your idea for your your side project well i was here, thinking vision os related like we're still sort of like now that with vision os being sort of like like now the, the latest beta requires that you have apple silicon um which is fine for me at the moment thankfully but um I kept thinking like, oh, geez, um, that's going to divide the amount of time I can work on it here versus work since work, I have an Intel based Mac. 
Um, oh my god, they need to get you. How is it 2023 and and your and workplace look, doesn't look, go? You know, yet? I'm not gonna. Uh, yeah, I've already made the argument. It's like, look, I can. My thing will compile. Well, now twice the argument is, fast. I must have it. I, yeah, well, first I have to convince. I have to convince them to to say, okay, getting a vision Vision Pro is something we want to do, and then I'm the guy for it, right? Like, it's so much faster building on a. I have an M1 Pro at work, and it's much faster than the Intel was, but. I don't know what's going to happen. Is is the net is Xcode fifteen? This is it going to be the time where they're going to force you to have Apple Silicon? Sonoma still run on Intel, or no? Yes, barely. I hear. Yeah, but I hear. Barely. Yeah, I hear. Like it's not quite. It, it's it's like I think it's more like the applications for whatever. Like particularly, it seems like Electron apps have struggled with the update. So that's my suspicion. Is something something to do with Electron apps is is messing things up. I'm saying you're gonna soon not be able to do your job without an uh, an apple silicon well i you know thankfully that that was much more of like an experimental thing at work but now um i mean now but if they if they if sonoma is like or in that or sometime the x15 i don't you think i'm saying is x15 going to be like eventually you must have i mean eventually they'll say you must have sonoma because they always do that yeah but are they going to be like you must have apple silicon at some point or I mean, I mean, well, they'll just keep it for Vision OS for now. So, so I don't know. With Vision OS, the requirement is you need Apple Silicon. Um, yeah, but it's it's a separate. It's a beta X code right now, yeah, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's not in the official the, X code, no, right? No, 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 no. So, what happens when they're combined? <sighs> well, Once you like, I, what, a, like, are they gonna, you know? Yeah, that's a good. Intel's that's a good point. officially dead. Yeah. What? Intel's officially dead. That's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking they're gonna be like, well, you must have Apple Silicon. And then your workplace is going to have to buy you one. So yeah, right, look forward. Uh, but in any case, um, I wanted to build a, I, I want to have a project that is specifically around, that's not Vision OS. So I wanted to do one that was was going to take the object capture framework that they give you a really good, um, a really good um, uh, sample app, uh, sample uh, app to, to sort of work with. And the Apple capture framework actually gives you a default UI that you can, you know, rotate your camera around an object. Um, uh, let's say you want to scan a, uh, an object, like a, like a Coke can, or maybe a Coke can is a bad example, maybe like a lantern or something, and you just want to just create a 3D object out of it. You can do that with mm-hmm. this framework by taking like a series, basically what you're doing is taking a series of pictures of all the sides of that object. Uh, you do it maybe like three sessions, like you, you turn over the, the uh, if, particularly if it's a cylindrical object, you turn it to the side so you can do a scan of the side and the bottom. And then maybe you do one more at a different angle just to get any of the rough edges of the space. But what it's doing is it's creating like a point cloud um, that will construct the uh, the entire uh, 3D object represent, uh, 3D object of that, um, of that, of all the pictures that you take. Usually it's in the range of like, 78 to 90 some 90 to 100 some odd pictures uh that that the that the um that the app will take now normally in the in this case in the sample app it, what it does is it constructs constructs it as a low poly version a low res version quote unquote um and then you can export the 3d model you know as a usd dz file to do whatever you want with um what I want to do is not, but you then you th- then Apple I think in the sample code just basically throws away the um, those those images. Um, what I want to do is basically copy all those images. I believe they're done. They're saved. They're probably saved as uh, HEIC files. So the size of these each of these images should be really small. Save them as a you know as a some binary or something, and then save them into CloudKit, and then create construct a Mac app. Um, that will download those files uh, from CloudKit and so that I could take the Mac app. And the Mac app allows you to use CreateML to create a high-res version of the same 3D object. So what I want to do is sort of construct a side project that will take the object uh, capture, take all the photos that, save all the photos, make sure that it's up in CloudKit and so that we can sync it to my Mac app, for which which will have enough power basically to run the um the high res version of the same command uh to construct a 3D object. Nice. And, then, and then you could use a 3D object in a Vision OS app. Yes. 
or like even if if uh, if you're doing like game like if you're just building game assets or uh, even yeah. product assets it's a really good way to do like really like when people get close up they're not seeing like jagged yeah. edges they're seeing like a really anything high quality AR. version and anything ar related in general mm-hmm. is good for this not even if it's not, even if it's not running on yeah. Yeah. vision os because i think i don't think vision the vision pro is going to uh be widely adopted anytime soon no even when it comes out it's no. like it's not going to be huge numbers so uh ar stuff is still going to be on the phone and ipads for most people for quite a while i think yeah but still cool there's still cool ideas for that i mean i, I we've talked about before about ideas about uh integrating like ar assets into movie productions like yeah making yeah. Vi- movies yeah. and making it easier to do like effects of sort or bring in like your real life objects or bring in uh because that's the thing you could bring in virtual objects mm-hmm. but bring in like your real life props in a virtual environment or doing stuff to them. Like, I don't know. It's, it's a, it's, it's a useful potential tool. I I've seen some cool demos on, uh, on X using uh, the scanning, scanning like statues and stuff. And, and, and I was like, I don't know how much time they spent. Cause they looked really good. I mean, the thing that's really funny about that is like, you have to learn how to properly hold your device Otherwise, you won't like you spend like forever trying to like get the right angle to scan the damn thing. Yeah. Hashtag you're holding it wrong. <laughs> yeah, no, literally you are. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh, yeah. no bumper will save you this time. No, not at all. Actually, you you, you have like it's hilarious because it has like this little like um, indicator that tells you what areas you need to continue trying to scan. So like there's like little dotted yeah. rings, and like they're like the they're they're all gray until you like you know you get the right one and it'll turn white just to indicate like what parts that are still like are are still so all the gray areas or the parts where you need to keep look like pointing your camera at so like you're doing this all the time it's like this is like one line that's left and you're just like come on (laughs) (laughs) capture the damn thing yeah so um but it's yeah but again like so oh go ahead uh, are we gonna are we gonna build this are you gonna build this i am going to start the project and we can all build it together uh but i'll I'll definitely build it because Whoa. I want to build it as a, for now as an internal project for my for my own purposes. Yeah, but then we can yeah. try it out. Yeah, we can try it out and because then... uh, we'll, we'll see if the cloud kit stuff works between multiple devices. We'll see. <laughs> One of the things that'd be interesting is like I'm going to use Swift data, so I'm using Swift data to manage uh, and architect the data model, for which then mm-hmm. we'll see how Swift data and cloud kit sync works out. Yeah, um, and uh, Osm has a course conveniently no ah, muhammad azam yes i yeah. will have to i will have to watch that course Set and goals. i'm telling you we, we should we should go into in the future episode all about observable and swift data mm-hmm. because i i mean i didn't really use any of the stuff until uh 17 went was released mm-hmm. i wasn't really using the betas and oh my god like it's just so much it's just nicer like yeah. observable is nicer mm-hmm. and and better yes. and uh yes. I, the little that i played with swift data is like wow this is so much better than Agreed. i mean it's basically core data it, underneath but it's like it's still better it's it's like more it fits in better with the I, swift I, world i feel it'll feel better until you have to like get into the really nooks and crannies and start doing like nested objects or net or references yeah. or that kind of stuff but but like the the, the 80 percent or whatever you you norm you, you start with is a lot easier yeah, so i don't i don't get you on board i don't think yeah. i'm doing anything too complicated so that's that's well, thankfully, we have Muhammad Azam's uh, right. his we're, we're, his his course. I did buy that course. I have to go back through more of them because well, he adds stuff to it. Well, he certainly had to change a lot. I remember uh, because yeah, of the, right. the changes that were happening mid midstream. Yeah. Oh, he was, it was that's not why I didn't use it during beta. It was like yeah. so. I would see his post and it was so broken. Yeah, it kept breaking. Yeah, I was like, okay. Uh, well, I think we I think we're like out of time yep, now. Yep. You have a hard out. Yes. So we have to wrap things up until next time. Yes, you can learn more about Philly Coco at phillycoco.org. There you'll find links to our Slack group, meetup schedule, and contact info. If you're feeling generous, leave a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or whatever your podcast platform of choice is. And please share us with all your developer friends. And one more thing, I'm back to jokes. So joke number one. (laughs) I think my partner is having an affair with a systems engineer. I saw them in bed. In bed? (laughs) As an embed, yeah. Anyway. Embed. <laughs> yes. Joke number two. Why why was Satan cast from heaven into C hell? Why? Because his code kept triggering undivine behaviors. Oh my god. 
Undiv- undivine behaviors. <laughs> Joke number three. Here are 10 reasons why out-of-bounds access is bad. Number 11 may surprise you. (laughs) That was good. I like that one. (laughs) Till next time. Good luck on your own developer journey. We will cheer for you always. Backyard squirrels.